What's up, everybody? This is Carrick with ACG, and welcome to a Q&A. This is for the month of November. I appreciate everybody giving me questions and different things that they wanted me to talk about during this. There are a lot, so I'm just going to jump straight on in here. The one thing I do want to remind people is uh, it's something I barely ever push, and I continue to remind myself that I need to. You know, if you follow me on Twitter, thumbs up the things or smile or star, whatever the fuck they are. So you can tell I don't do Twitter that much, but, uh, you know, heart those things, like them, whatever. That actually does help. The affiliate links help. And of course, being on Patreon helps. But one of the things I always seem to forget to push is things like Twitter and Facebook. And I really should be doing that more. And that'll sort of be my New Year's resolution for the channels to push more of that. So let's just jump straight on in here. We have a bunch of questions. And I feel that the quicker I uh, start, the easier it will be on you guys. So Dirk Nurse says, what is one series that saddens you that it's gone? Uh, that's pretty easy, and it would be Virtual Fighter. You know, I think that when we look at any genre, there's one that's just geriatric in its evolution, and that is fighters. We are in such dire straits with fighters right now that we're getting games like Street Fighter, whatever the fuck you want to call it, Point Five, which is a game that basically was delivered in such a shoddy misrepresentation of what a finished product should be that multiple different people have actually called for a re-release of it because of all of the problems. I would love to see the fighting genre elevate and virtual fighter is one of the titles that I absolutely loved. I was really good at virtual fighter, but it was the fact that it was a little bit more realistic in its martial arts. Yes, I get it. It wasn't super realistic because you had cage doing flips and you had Laos stomping people's chests in, but that was why I liked it so much. In fact, I named one of my dogs after Lao, who was my favorite character of all time. That's actually really where Cadiz and I cut our teeth in friendship when it came to games was the consistent a really revolution of com competition that could happen in Virtual Fighter because, you know, you'd get better at one thing. Somebody else would pick up that you were doing that. So they'd s try something else. And you got to just see that interplay. Fantastic. And I wish to see more. And I don't think we ever will. Torque says, oh, sorry about that. Torque says, what's the issue with the podcast? I have tweets about it. Speaking of tweets, I just got one. So the issues with the podcast, there isn't really an issue. Basically, what happened was I had to change internet providers due to the bandwidth restrictions that some of the internet providers have. As a reviewer who reviews every version of a game, for example, if it's a larger game, I could be downloading 40 gigs per version and at least three versions, if not four, if let's say I want to test it on um, a PS4 and a PS4 Pro right? So you have this situation where downloading a ton, it, it, going up against bandwidth, uh, you know, fees of all kinds and issues of all kinds. I'm going to turn off my phone here. I just decided, you know what, I'm going to switch internet providers. Well, the problem with that was I found out quite quickly that switching internet providers, um, you know, there was a reason why the one company was the, the, the one that most people went with, which uh, was the fact that this new internet provider is a little bit slower. And so when it comes to the international podcast, of course, international is going to be the where that base comes from. You're going to see the folks like Silver and Rejeku, but you also see the return of Rick on occasional ones. You'll see somebody like Cosmic, who actually lived out of states for many years, his entire childhood, basically, and then came here. And he has a great uh, a great overall different look to the international podcast. But even more so, we have folks like Lance. Landon, who, though he didn't live elsewhere, he is sort of a, a unique bird in that he was international when it comes to he handled retail, which is a completely different nation than the rest of us, if you really think about it that way. So he's sort of somebody that I grandfathered in. Um, we have 145 to 200 different requests to get into those. And of course, if you're a patron, those are a separate set of broadcasts and we put those together and we do behind the scenes podcasts. Sometimes they just want to talk to me. But if you are a patron and you're at the level to request something, by all means, feel free to request it from me because I will only usually send one reminder at the starting of the month. And then through the time as the month goes on, I'll remind people of special things coming up, but I won't continue to bother you about something. You need to get a hold of me and say, hey, you know what? I saw your email and I do want to do this because I put out that reminder and I can't just continue to bother you about it. So if you're a patron and you want to jump on one of the podcasts or just talk to me, definitely say something in the patron itself and I will help you out and we will do a ton because I love me some talking about games. Uh, next one up Joseph, what do you think about Resident Evil 7? Uh, nothing. I don't think about Resident Evil 7. Resident Evil is one of those series that if you look at it and you parse it out by episode by episode and 
you really see a game that really hasn't done very well, uh, you know, I guess sequel to sequel. It's a game where I feel that some sequels are magnificent, even though they're technically sort of an offshoot like Code Veronica and others, which I could mention hundreds, we won't even get into because they're not that good. Resident Evil 7 looks like it might be interesting, but I am one of those type of people that when it comes to the Resident Evil games, it is definitely a wait and see situation because Resident Evil has been so hit and miss in the past. So I'm interested in it. I'll just say that. Extra Festive Darley. Daryl. Daryl? Extra Festive Daryl, I think is what that says. Uh, what do you hope to see out of the next mainline Assassin's Creed game? That's actually really good. Now, I want to make sure people understand when I review a game, I review it for two different distinct groups. One, which are folks like myself who played all of the past games. And two, for people who literally that's their first one. And that happens all the time. You know, I think it's easy for us to say, I'm the only one who matters. It's normal human evolution to take care of oneself. But when it comes to the gaming industry, there are people entering every single day. And this holiday, we oh, best news ever. We are going to have so many new fucking people jumping into gaming. I don't know about you, but that is literally the most exciting thing that I will probably have all year is the fact that this Christmas, new people will be getting new systems, including... Actually, I can't say because I'm getting some people some systems this Christmas. I almost gave that away and they watch the they watch the video. So we've got some new people who are jumping in the game for the first time. So what do I want to see? Well, I would definitely like to see a, a complete shoring up of how it doles out information when you start the game. I've found that at times they have forgotten newcomers completely and they've really forgotten the bite. You know, the bite to me is when you start playing a game, you care. You know, the Assassin's Creed games have forgotten that new people are entering the market. And so what happens is you get an Assassin's Creed game where you jump in and they sort of assume you know about what the fuck is going on. And it, and many times they almost don't do anything for a newcomer. And I think for newcomers to sort of get new blood into these titles and start talking about them in a positive way as well, then uh, you're going to have to do that. And additionally, it is very easy for a bunch of us angry people to sit in a fucking little tiny room. I wish they could, you know, in some way tap the energy from a bunch of angry gamers in a room, a bunch of us angry grognards who remembered the original Assassin's Creed and the beauty of that first trailer. And you could get some power off that because we power a small city block. You got you got to you got to know that. But I want to see the newcomers coming because they remind you sometimes. How many times has that happened? As long as you're a normal human where you're talking to somebody and somebody reminds you of something that, you know, you thought was ultimately maybe mostly negative, And then somebody reminds you of the good stuff. It's almost like you see in movies where somebody's having a bad relationship and the guy who's been single all his life, who's 750 pounds and smells of nothing but bacon grease and questionable nights looks over and says, dude, at least you got a chick or chick, at least you got a dude. So I like the new influx. And that's what I'd like to see is a, a, a reminder that new people are getting into this and not just a way in which to gently masturbate and massage the angry people and the angry social dynamics that go on when it comes in particular to Assassin's Creed games. I would also like to see them continue to move towards a multiple protagonist dynamic. Now, a lot of people may not be happy about that, but I loved Syndicate and I liked the two protagonists, especially in the DLC later, which was primo. So I like that. And I don't mean that they have to do it. I just mean I would like that. That interests me. Lastly, dynamic weather, dynamic lighting needs to stay. I loved Syndicate. I loved that passing of time. There's something that makes you so feel solidified within the fiction when time passes. A racing game, when time passes, when seasons change, when rain falls, when the rain goes away, when the sun comes out. Those things are vital. Those things are super important. And I want to see Assassin's Creed never go back to anything static in that way. Uh, next up, Darth Rezik says, what's your thoughts on Death Stranding's cast? None. Death Stranding is CGI. Death Stranding means nothing right now, and I do not get interested in those kind of things too much because of the simple fact that we have no fucking clue what it really means. And that is pretty much that. Uh, I just have nothing to say about it. Uh, Darth asks another question. Do you believe mobile will shape AAA gaming in the future? Uh, well, yeah, if it's if it's shaped it yesterday, it'll shape it tomorrow. And I think that AAA gaming will shape mobile gaming. That's the way it works. That's the way different sports look at the success of another sport and try to mimic it. Look at different things within other sports and try to mimic it. Everything within an industry, the car industry, doesn't decide, hey, Joe Bob's putting seatbelts in their car, but fuck it, we're not going to worry about it in ours. So everybody will sort of take from, and there's an incestuous relationship relationship, especially in the improvements that we see or the ways in which companies feel that they can make money. So
So yeah, we will see them continue to sort of take some of their lead from mobile games, but I also think that there will be a pulling back a little bit by some of the developers and publishers away from the mobile dynamic. One of the things to remember is you can always look at something that was that is within the same industry, but you should never wholeheartedly immediately jump into it because here's the thing. If you and I are talking and I say, let's look at that other part of the industry, there's a reason why it's called another part of the industry. If not, it would be within your part of the industry and you could take whatever improvements or fix whatever weaknesses other games have, but they're not. They are a different part. They are mobile and thus they are delivered differently. And for some reason, some people, especially at some publishers, got it into their mind that, oh, look over there, there's something they're doing. Let's just throw it into this section. And that's idiotic. It's at the very least completely logically broken. And so we need a little bit more intelligence when looking at other aspects of the game industry so that we don't have a situation where somebody looks somewhere else and says, hey, let's do exactly what they're doing, not realizing that the very point that they are taking from this is that they are fucking different. So I would love to see that uh, sort of smooth out a little bit. Uh, let's see. Novik says, why don't you review old games? Uh, I, I could pull some time out of my ass. Guys, I'm so friggin' busy right now. And, um, you know, I work... I, I play games six, five to seven days a week, depending on what I'm doing. And I enjoy games seven days a week, regardless. Uh, my, the lack of burnout for me is probably what you guys, uh, and, and why there isn't a worry about burnout for me is most likely because of the way in which I do look at games from a newcomer's eyes, because I'm reviewing for them, plus old timers reviewing for somebody like myself. But when it comes to reviewing old games, that doesn't really necessarily fit within the overall theme of ACG. ACG is a little bit more consumer branded and a little bit more of my promise to you guys that if at all possible, the moment you try to buy a game or very shortly thereafter, you will have a full fledged review that is completely detailed from start to finish. And none of this bullshit with somebody playing the first hour and saying a quick look is a review because fuck you, it's not. We know that right now and hopefully we'll create sort of a resurgence where people will take some of this data and go, you know what? It's not, uh, you know, a lot of the people I talk to when I talk about games and I say, you know, you, you watch this quick look and you decide you like the game and you're unhappy with it. Well, one of the reasons why is it's a fucking quick look. You know, you, you didn't see the later gameplay elements. You didn't see the loops or if they were repetitive. I only have certain t amount of time and, and that's usually lodged around showing that for new games, not for old ones, because there's enough information out there for folks for the old games that I don't feel I need to do that for them. Let's see. Oh, choo, 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 choo. Denzel says, how do you feel about GameStop signing devs? So it sucks, but I do want to say that, you know, it's a storefront, GameStop. It's just like Amazon. They've got their own devs now. And it's just like Origin is EA and they've got their devs and a publisher and they're a storefront. In in a weird way, I hate it. And we talked about this in the last podcast when Landon was on because he's re, he was retail. And I, I was I'm really just down on it, but I'm also completely business savvy enough to understand how it works and that it's going to happen. It's difficult to understand how it's all going to lay out so far and how they're going to stop you know anti competition and all of these different weird issues that may pop up. But when it comes down to it. I don't like the idea, but you know what? I'm completely okay with it happening because we have to see how it's going to how it's going to sort of come to fruition. And some of the people we're talking about now, somebody who's watching ACG or somebody who's watching, you know, Cosmic or somebody who's watching Dreamcast Guy or somebody who's watching Mr. Matty plays is possibly a future developer and may see some of these warnings, may decide on their own what they want to do and what they don't want to do, and will take that into the industry. Far be it from me to say we're the only ones and that this person wouldn't have thought it themselves. I'm just simply saying that's sort of how everything comes around. That's how information is passed down. So I want to say I don't like the idea, but I'm willing to see what happens to sort of uh, look at it and possibly learn from it. Nick says, are you excited for Andromeda? No. Kyle, regarding PC, do you perform desk or do you prefer, do you perform, do you perform on your desktop or laptop? Well, I like to dance. Uh, do you prefer desktop or laptop? Well, absolutely, without a shadow of a doubt, desktop, laptop's great. I have a super powerful one that I do some testing on. That is fine to have. I love to take it to GDC, take it to PAX, take it to events in San Francisco. I've done a couple PR events. But the thing is, it will never really be a desktop. One of the issues that I like about desktops is I absolutely, without a shadow of a doubt, hate keyboard 
and and mouse pad or anything connected to the device itself. It's too close. Usually what I do is I bring along extras, uh, you know, an extra cable and an extra USB so I can plug it into the laptop. That's great to have that power. But by that point, you might as well just get a little mini desktop and be done with it. Uh, I do not like it. Also, even with the advents in technology that we have, the improvements in continually upgrading, I am not happy with how closed off they are as a platform. Let's see. Arky says, how do you manage to beat and review so many games? Uh, it's not that many, guys. I, I, I don't know how many times I'll say this, but I will I will probably just post that as like the number one question that I answer each and every uh, Q&A. It's not that many games. And, you know, sometimes I, I hear people say, oh, you know, hey, you, you, I see that you're doing this or I see that you're doing that. How'd you do these two games on the same day? And I didn't. When we get the games, there can be a week where there's no other games. And then a game that you get with just a couple days, you're done with the first one. You do the second one. You post them back up on the same day because of the way games are released on that Tuesday, Thursday release pattern. So while there might have been a couple times where, yes, I guess I did do a good number in a small amount of time, overall, it's not that many. And there is usually a good deal of time to prep as long as I am intelligent. Also, I'm a freak for scheduling. I've said this many times. I schedule everything when it comes to gaming. The moment I get a game, I'm hitting a recorder and I'm sitting down and playing it. Also, reviewing for me is not as difficult, at least from what I've talked, you know, when I've talked to Maddie or talked to Cosmic Engine uh, or talked to some, you know, I guess you'd call them the big professionals. I find that reviewing is not anywhere near as difficult for me as it is for them. And that's most likely because I don't know why, but uh, it doesn't at this time sort of cause me too much of an issue. So I don't consider I beat and review very many games. Others do. Uh, we'll just have to sort of agree to disagree because I know what's going on in the background, I guess. I don't know. Uh, Carrick, how come you didn't review The Last of Us? I don't have the question for this because um, that was out way before I even reviewed. So that that was not available for me. Probably the same reason I didn't review Super Mario Brothers 1. Derek. I got a bit of conspiracy theory for you. Do you think it's possible that by the failure of Titanfall 2, it could have been planned from the start by EA? By that, I mean, was it released on the worst possible date so that EA could blame Respawn for the game not selling well and then take control away from them when it comes to future titles or DLC? Considering Titanfall 2 was the only EA game ever made with no shady business model, DLC, season pass, uh, map packs, etc., built on milking the customer. Well, first of all, that's not really a conspiracy theory when you understand how conspiracy theories work. That's actually just a, what would you call it? A, a, a fairly negative business plan, but a sound one if they wanted something to come out of this. We've seen it in, in every industry where a deal was done to, in some way, even though it seemed positive for both, to in some way elevate one group above the other. Do I believe that this happened? Personally, no. Do I believe that there's a chance I am wrong? Absolutely. Because there is a lot of oddities about what happened with Titanfall 2, the lack of PR and so forth, and the issues obviously with Respawn and how they deal now with EA. It is completely possible, but I don't just firmly believe it right now because I haven't, I mean, until some there's a smoking gun email, it's very difficult to understand if it's just a bad decision. I think we should all really sit down and realize that it's very easy to be conspiratorial in a situation that is, for some gamers, very negative. It is uh, better to be conspiratorial because, as humans, I've said this before, we are conspiratorial by nature because it protects us. If I'm always looking behind every bush, then Oogla, the other caveman, gets chewed up before I do because I fucking saw the giant man-eating dangler or whatever the new creature is that was in the caveman days that we don't ever get to see. I wish I lived back then because I bet you there's some cool fucking creatures you could ride if you could tame them. So that kind of stuff is normal to me, but at the same time, I don't believe it's always the way it is. I heard somebody just a couple days ago just going off in a conspiracy theory, and I was like, do you think that it's possible that this multinational corporation made a mistake, just didn't do things right? Because we see it everywhere. But unfortunately, with things like, you know, Dieselgate and stuff like that, it's much easier to believe. Much easier. So in no way, shape, or form am I, am I teasing this, this question. It is much easier for us to believe the conspiracies. Currently, though, I do not. David, Freedom Fighters, have you played it? And did you, and what did you think? Uh, Freedom Fighters was a long time ago. I did play it. I think I remember not liking the controls. Uh, Denzel asks, any video game movies you would like to see? Any Denzel, any video game movies you like? Oh, okay. Any video game movies that I like? Um, yeah, well, hmm. A comic book, 
to video game to movie would be like The Punisher. I liked the video game on the PS2, um, but that's about it. There isn't a lot that I've really been in love with. Some are okay, um, but that's an odd question because, not an odd question, sorry, but it's it's a question that's d difficult to answer because now you've got comic books that are video games, video games that are comic books to game, and it, it's difficult to even remember sometimes what was just a game before it was anything else. Let's see. David says, what is your game of the year? I don't have one. Diago says, uh, recently started playing Knights of the Old Republic online. Have you played it? What do you think? Have I played it? I have played it. What do I think? It's fucking awesome. Listen, Knights of the Old Republic maybe didn't come out under the best circumstances, maybe didn't do the greatest job as an online title right away. But one thing and one place where it had its chops was the online story component feeling a little bit like the original KOTOR. Not as good, but let's not be or let's be honest. It's that's very difficult to do. I absolutely love that game. I continue to return to it when I can get Cadiz to do so as well. He's always up for it. It's just sometimes because I'm really busy. I think it's a fantastic online game for what it offers. It's not perfect, and it may not even be the best online game, but it is a way for me to get some really good, enjoyable travel across the stars in what I consider to be a very important and interesting time within Star Wars that Disney seems to have said, fuck you about. And so I want to give them the support I can because at some point, unfortunately, when that goes away, it's going to be this odd time where a lot of what I grew up with thinking made Star Wars great will be gone and we're going to be left with these shit ass movies because I'm not a fan of the new ones either, unfortunately. Uh, let's see. King. How, uh, balancing work, family, love for video games. Any suggestions? Uh, no, do do what works for you. For me, I probably don't balance it the well at at, at, that well at times. There have been times where I've said, hey, I can't do stuff with the guys. Um, my wife, I've said, I can't do stuff. I can't you know, go and visit my family because of this. That'll change as the years progress and maybe I'm able to, you know, uh, like schedule better or get games at, at, you know, at a different time and sort of have a little bit more behind me when I request something. So somebody's like, okay, we'll give this guy uh, this game right now because he asked that kind of thing. But when it comes down to it, I wouldn't say I'm the best. I would say that what I do is everybody, since I was young, since I pretty much graduated, even before that, uh, everybody had always said, you know, he is what he is. Like, there isn't a lot of secrets about me. I'm just, this is the way I am, the way you guys see it. I'm very straight in the way I deal with things, and that includes what I enjoy. So every person that, let's say, I dated or every new friend I met, I wasn't one of, met, I wasn't one of those people that was, like, hiding the fact that I like to go and play d and I wasn't a person who hid the fact that I played video games. I was open about it from day one. And so the people that attracted to me as friends or a, a spouse or girlfriends or just people in my life all understood what I was like. And I think that that's important. I think I guess I would switch and say, yeah, I've got a little bit of advice and that's continue to be true to you because if you're not, you can't uphold the lie. I've talked about this when I talk about reviews. I've talked about this when I talk about pretty much everything is that if, if you start to hold on to all the hatreds of gaming or if you start to in this way, uh, change yourself for others, it too much. There's a situation that develops where your your brain just can't remember all the lies. It can't remember all the weird things because it's not natural for you. And you can enact new patterns and you should at times to grow. But overall, I think as long as you are honest and not hurting anybody, um, especially when you first meet them, they understand who you are. You understand who they are. You should be OK. If you have a further question about that in particular, you can give it to me, but that's pretty generic and that's my generic answer. Zach says, favorite Christmas present you've ever received? Yes. It's not a video game present, but those those were awesome. Uh, I was dating a person um, just absolutely, you know, as I said in the Sherlock Holmes, devil's daughter, probably, I mean, just, and <laughs> she never watches, which is good, but uh, just an absolute disaster of a relationship. It's one of those relationships that you can quite literally paint fucking Titanic on the side of my face the moment I start going after somebody. And it was that kind of situation. But she got me something that I had only mentioned once, and I'm a big fan of getting Christmas presents that for people that they don't necessarily want, but that I've seen excitement in their eyes when they see something they forget around Christmas time, right? That's that's big for me. I'm a big, I love big Christmases and, and giving away stuff. And what it was, was a Frank Franzetta art, uh, the Conan, one of the guy who originally did Conan, it was an art book and it was a very, very expensive art book. And at some point I had mentioned that I liked that art at that time, or I was very interested in it, but I hadn't really gone out of my way to explain it to this, this person. And 
they went and found it and got it for me for Christmas. And that stuck with me for years. Uh, it, it, I would say it even bought them, it didn't buy them any uh, niceties that they didn't deserve, but it certainly shows that within that cold storage shed of a heart that she had, somewhere beat a little bit of a sliver that thought of other people. Additionally, I would say a skateboard. So I was for a very brief time into skateboarding until I realized it took pure skill and I got a skateboard for Christmas and my parents hid it and we pretended all the Christmas presents were done and I was like, great, okay. And then my mom and dad were like, oh, we've got one more. And I was completely surprised by it. I thought they'd just forgotten they brought down a skateboard, which I had wanted, but I wasn't one of those. I wasn't like, oh, I didn't get it for Christmas because I had other stuff. That was awesome. That was insane. And, and I absolutely have never been that hurt in my life. Hurt just tr learning how to skateboard out in the woods, which is where I lived, we had the old crappy, it was pavement, but it's that th pavement with the, you know, thick granules in it. Try to ride a fucking skateboard on that shit. Uh, that was, uh, that's a good memory. I, b I broke that skateboard um, over somebody's head. So next up, uh, Hinnock says, ever played League of Legends? What's your view on it? No, I have not. My view is that a lot of friggin' people like it, so they're probably right. Jason, how come you never did a review for The Last of Us? Another one. Um, the last of us with the announcement of part two, would you consider doing one? No. Um, I, I will say this, the last of us was again, prior to when I reviewed, I did play a little bit of it and it's, it hasn't aged that well for me in the gameplay chops. It was okay. It wasn't, I wasn't just like blown away. And unfortunately with that many people talking about it, it's hard not to expect something. So I'll probably revisit it again prior to the new one coming out. But um, yeah, I won't be doing a review. James says, hi, Carrick. Some games are VR enabled, allowing you to also play it without VR gear. I think Resident Evil 7 is doing this. Will your reviews cover both the VR playthrough and the normal playthrough? Because I'm sure those impressions will be completely different. Um, yeah, I've already done that, actually, with uh, House of the Dying Sun. So yeah, yeah, it definitely will. Uh, YKZ5 Tech asks, as a game critic, what advice would you give a new game developer like me? Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> So there's multiple bits, but you guys are much smarter than I. All I can say, I'm coming from as a game player and what I look for. The game has to be fun, right? And it has to be fun in whatever way. If it's a football game, it's probably high octane and there has to be some fun action. If it's a shooter, high octane has to be fun action, Michael Bay moments. Uh, or if it's not that kind and it's more cerebral, it has to be suspenseful moments. Every game has a certain type of fun. If it's a puzzle game, it has to have that cerebral fun and the, and the feeling of success, which is tied in directly into that entertainment. You have to find that. You have to find it and you have to just absolutely rub that thing raw and make sure that it's it's pretty impervious to to F ups, to fuck ups and then and then blow it out into the rest of your game and understand how to make it uh, how to make it uh Continue to be fun, even if you want to add new things to it. What we see now is we get gaming by committee, gaming by ultimate umbrella design, which is that if this one thing is cool, let's have two things that are somewhat like it, but slightly different. In fact, I'll give you a weird role playing uh, rule set where I come from that I feel actually destroyed a lot of uh, the uniqueness there. And one of the reasons why I think games have this issue, I still remember back in the day when you picked classes, when you were role playing and, and some games still do this, by the way, but I'm talking about when there was only three or four different kinds of gaming and you would pick a certain race or a certain uh, class and they would give you a bonus to your attribute, like a plus two to dexterity. And then later on, as in all honesty, the complexity started to be added on top of a simplicity that was snuck in. It wasn't It wasn't just that complexity was added, there was some simplicity snuck in, but they hid it under this umbrella of complexity. I still remember the first time I read a rule that said if you buy this skill, you can now switch, and so instead of using dexterity for this, you can use strength. Or instead of strength, you can use dexterity, thus technically defeating the original reason for your choice at the starting or at the very least making mini maxing become a little bit easier. Now we can argue for days about role playing, but I felt that that uniqueness was slightly pinched. And that's what I think happens with games. Somebody has a fun idea and they push that forward and somebody else jumps in and says, well, it's too complex. Let's add something here. Let's let's make it simplistic. And somebody else says, well, if if we're doing this sim simplistic bit, we need to add some complexity, but it's really a fake complexity. It's a, a fucking smorgasbord of things you need to find around the game world. And then somebody else says, well, that is complex. That's great. Let's add some 
a simplicity somewhere else so they can do it. Let's make sure the minimap tells them everywhere to fucking go. And you have this odd truncated game development where it's simplistic but complex but simplistic at the same time. And really what happens is it doesn't feel real. It doesn't feel like the core gameplay is there. So if you have core gameplay and you're a developer, fucking find that core gameplay and make sure that everything you do, every goddamn thing you do, feeds back to the core aspect in which you find entertainment in your game. That's what needs to happen. You do not need these hanging threads of duplicity that are sitting around that are multiple fucking feathers to capture or something like that. Even though I've caught all those feathers, it still doesn't mean that they're great in the gameplay element of it. So if you find something fun and you're a game developer, if there's some aspect of your title that you think's unique, uh, hold that motherfucker. You know, put post-it notes around your around your desk. So every time you sit down, it says like, you know, uh, if your game is a shooter, the shooter has to be fun Every single moment has to increase the fun of the shooting. And don't forget it. Why to DJ? What game are you playing the most right now and why? Sims 4. I love Sims 4. I love to just sit down and do absolutely terrible things to people. Um, lately, I've just been absolutely breeding like a son of a bitch, running through Sims 4, just dating chicks. Uh, and then breaking up with them and then building a nice house and then dating another chick and breaking up with them. And I love seeing the little red lines of relationships every time I go around town. Everybody, I don't think in Sims 4 you can ever date somebody you, you've been in a relationship with and broke it off with. So I have like this line of people that I've broken up with and all of their relationship status bars are red. That's I have no clue why. I just woke up one day and I was like, hey, this sounds like fun. Uh, Sims 4 is fantastic fun for me to just sit back and click on some shit and watch stuff happen. I love AI, so it's very interesting to see how they work with their va various AI sensibilities. And really, it's funny because uh, talking to somebody who is going to do a, a podcast with me here soon on AI, we were actually laughing about how The Sims shows to the player what many games hide from the player when it comes to how their creatures and, and activities and situations are actually worked out for the AI. And the player actually sees far more of that, despite anybody's inherent hatred for The Sims. That was very cool to hear. Let's see. Garrett says, from a, finish, or from a financial standpoint, do you think people should invest in PC gaming or consoles. Okay. Uh, wrong word for me, at least in neither one is a fucking investment. Sorry. Uh, at all. I think that uh, from a financial standpoint, everybody's different. Everybody's it's even hard for me sometimes when I'm saying a games worth 60 or not worth 60. Cause somebody will say, well, I only have, I only buy games for 20 and I'll be like, well then either why are you here? Number one, if you know, and you've heard me say this or number two, you need to do your own math and figure out what a buy is, what a weight is. And, and, and then go on that and ignore my amounts. Everybody is different in their finances. And I don't really think either one is great to be brutally honest at, at all, actually. So let's see. Kurt says, if you could go back 20 years and speak to yourself, what's the one thing you would tell yourself about gaming? I would say, watch out for that one chick, the brunette. <laughs> the second would be the second would be probably think of becoming a reviewer earlier than I did. Um, sadly enough, becoming a reviewer and, and, and making a YouTube channel has been uh, probably the best thing that's ever happened to me when it comes to gaming. And there's a delightful change that happened to me a couple years ago that has, has allowed me to do reviewing. But when I was younger, I was involved in some of the same just absolutely brutal, ju just juvenile discussions about, you know, what consoles better and, and, you know, this and that. And this game sucks because this this game's good. And I missed a lot. And those those will never, ever be experiences I can have day one with everybody else because I was ignorant. And as times have changed and I jumped into reviewing and I sort of realized I want to review for somebody who's played a bunch of Assassin's Creeds and somebody who hasn't, somebody who's played all the Halos and somebody who's jumping in day one. It opened up this weird feeling that I don't know how to describe. It's almost as if you maybe have been reading a certain type of book all your life. Let's say you were reading fantasy all your life and somebody gave you a sci-fi book and you had nothing else to read. So you picked it up and your brain halfway through the first 15 pages, your brain says, holy shit a new entire genre has opened up to me. There is something that is in your life and in my life, it is going to happen very few times where that feeling sort of comes up from your gut and you can go, holy shit, 
something brand new just happened. Something incredibly new just happened. And that's happened to me as a reviewer. And for me to be able to go back and tell myself 20 years ago to maybe think about doing this earlier would probably be the number one thing I would want to do. Pierre, what game you what game got you into gaming? I mean, hmm. I mean, I played Pong. I'm trying to think of what got me into gaming. Probably uh, Fantasy Star for the Sega Master System and Space Harrier for the Sega Master System for two different reasons. Space Harrier because it was absolutely insanely difficult and it taught me that biting through controller cords costs me money and fixes absolutely fucking nothing. The second is Fantasy Star because I ended up calling the Sega uh, helpline 1 800 blah 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 blah. And I talked to a worker there and we became friends in real life and I still know them and, and that sort of got me on the road this 80s. Nine, nine, yeah, uh, or early 90s, late 80s, got me into sort of talking to some people in the industry and have got me friends, some who've left. And that was actually very enjoyable. Uh, let's see. Sounds German asks, do you play games still for enjoyment or is it work? If you are, what are you playing to relax? Well, I sort of answered that, but yeah, I play, I love games, guys. There is no, from the day I started reviewing to now, there has been zero drop off in my enjoyment for games. And it, it games are fun for me. You know, I think one of the reasons why is because when I deliver my reviews, the way I do them, the way I interact with the, the people, the way I, I like the socialness of the situations and some of the fans that I've had and some of the people I've got to meet in the industry, Gilberto, who, who used to do PR for uh, Ubisoft, has moved off to a different company. But he's somebody that I quite literally, even though our um, you know interactions have been about that in the past, have sort of branched out to just discussing things, saying, you know, you know, hope you're having a good holiday, just sort of a building on those relationships, like normal friendships and stuff like that. That's what I count as important. And that's what I count as fantastic. And there's a lot of people out there. And, you know, there's the people who are making the kinetic uh, Kickstarter. I would, I mean, I would consider Bloom like not necessarily, I mean, I wouldn't want to say I'm a friend of, of his because I think that that would be claiming too much on my part. But the fact that, uh, we enjoy talking to each other so much is it. I don't know how to describe it. I don't know how to describe how awesome that is. I just don't. It's very difficult to say how fucking awesome that is to meet these people and be involved in that. And I think that maybe that's why sometimes you notice I don't seem to get burned out as, as much or at all because at least for the last three years, I'm still in some kind of uh, love period. Maybe it'll re maybe it'll it'll turn off, but right now, no. Uh, Patash says, "What are your outside gaming hobbies?" That's a good question. I've covered a couple. Airsoft, absolutely. Airsoft gets you out of the house. Super physical. Uh, 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 let's see, Guido, Vanzel, Wow, you've seen them on podcasts. Cadiz, obviously. Uh, Panther, but he, uh, I don't know if we posted his podcast. He, they're all into Airsoft as well. Airsoft is fantastic fun for me and one of the few actual outside skills that I've learned that have helped video gaming and have helped uh, tactics, have helped to learn different um, ways in which to do things. Airsoft is fantastic fun. One of the most enjoyable things I have ever come across. Speaking of earlier, when I was saying that there are very few times when you will realize there's a whole new thing out there. It is airsoft for me. Let me give you a little tiny story about me. I was a big role player all my life, super big into role playing, super big into martial arts, boxing, you know, all of that kind of stuff. But it was definitely video games and role playing. Video games and role playing are fairly sedentary. Luckily, I was able to balance that out because I'm very physically active and I like to lift weights. I like to power lift. I like to do whatever. One day late at night, it was during a Christmas, about five Christmases ago, I went on Amazon and somehow, for reasons I still can't describe to you why this happened, an airsoft gun appeared on the Amazon like what you might be interested in list. And uh, as anybody who knows me will say, when when Carrick dives into a subject, he dives in like no one. And it is true. I spent about three fucking weeks doing nothing, nothing, but solidifying every bit of data I could about Airsoft, everything from the technology to the environment, the social uh, stigma that goes with it, the different national laws like how Japan treats it versus how the UK treats it or is going to treat it, um, all of Europe, uh, obviously uh, America. And it, it was that same thing, that moment where you're like, oh shit, I have a whole new thing for me. 
Airsoft was like that. And I will cherish the day that happened until I die. That was so amazing to discover something so big and so enjoyable and physically active, which I think is very uh, important for gamers. Let's see. Oh, and uh, outside, I paint miniatures. I mix music. I do producing. Uh, I Headphone reviews. I do some random stuff like that. All right. So, Sean, I am sick. Do you have a favorite game when sick? No, I do not play games when sick very often. Usually what I do is watch TV shows and the more documentary style, the better. I like to learn. So um, I've just finished watching every episode of How It's Made for, uh, I think that's Discovery Channel. Uh, usually I will pick the largest series possible if I can see if there's something like four or 500 episodes total, you know, or 200 episodes even. That's what I jump into. I love things that are massive like that and just diving into it. Civil War documentaries, World War II. Uh, World War II in color was fascinating to me. Those kind of stuff, those kind of things. But no, I don't uh, I don't really play games when I am ill. Edmund says, what do you think the of the Final Fantasy VII remake being episodic? Uh, I can't answer that. I don't really know enough about it yet to see why they've done it. I think once the first one comes out, we'll sort of know why it happened. I, I'm not 100% in love with it. Andra, or Andre says, any advice for persuading someone's wife or spouse on getting a 4K TV? Yeah, don't. Don't. Do not buy a 4K TV right now. Wait till the spring update. I cannot tell you why, but you absolutely will be happy to do so. Do not buy one now unless you absolutely have to. Also, does a PS4 help if not running a 4K TV? I'm assuming you mean if it's 1080p, will the PS4 Pro help it? Will it downsample and stuff like that? And that depends on the game, but many games, yes, it absolutely will. It will downsample or it will run at a higher frame rate, which is rare, but that does sometimes happen. Yes, for a fact, that does help running many games on the uh, on a TV that is not 4K. I think the PS4 Pro, I haven't really hid my utter disdain for that technology. Um, it's, you know, completely one-sided on the GPU side. There's issues everywhere. I think that uh, I think that if you're maybe, let's say, deciding if you want to get one, you know, if it's a Christmas situation, whatever. But if it's after that, I would hold off just a little bit and let some of those patches come in. Let developers sort of figure out where they're going with this, because uh, there's a lot of little issues with the PS4 Pro that I'm I don't feel that buying another system for another four hundred dollars should ever accrue, should ever occur. Sorry. So that's it for me. That's a lot. It's 41 minutes. I apologize. I didn't know it was going to go that long. I didn't realize there were that many questions. Uh, as always, thank you very much for asking the questions. It's important that we get these out. And it's important that I keep up to date on the Q&A because in the past I have slightly forgot. But I just want to say thanks to everybody. Anybody who's got through all this, thank you very much for watching the you know, the shows, thanks for sticking through some of these longer videos and, and thanks for supporting the channel. You know, there's times where maybe we'll all just, you know, disagree, maybe vehemently, uh, maybe even be assholes about it. It happens. I've done it. You've done it. Uh, but it's been an extraordinary time. And I, I hope to be here for another, uh, you know, five or 10 years before I die from eating a pound of bacon. Peace out. Enjoy the rest of your week. Oh, if you like it, thumbs up. If you dislike it, thumbs down. Now, peace out. Enjoy the rest of your week.